Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Emma Viglin is out today. I want to welcome to the program Dr. Peter J. Hotez, Dean for the National School of Tropical, Med uh, of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and author of The Deadly Rise of Anti-Science, uh, anti A Scientist's Warning. Um, uh, doctor, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks for having me, Sam. So this is actually um, a, a, at least your second book. Um, and, and really the sort of like the second book and where you've had to weigh in on the, the question of anti-vaxxers uh, or anti-vax or vaccine hesitancy. Um, and it's, I'm struck by the fact that like very different eras books that were written like six years apart, but very different eras, uh, within this, this movement. Um, w tell us this, the, the, the context of your first book and, yeah. and how that came about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things I do, I like to write about a little bit about the geopolitics of infectious diseases in addition to being a vaccine scientist. And, um, the way I got involved with going up against the anti-vaccine movement and dealing with people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., et cetera, was um, I have four adult kids, including Rachel, who has autism and intellectual disabilities. And the first book I wrote, which is, was called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's uh, Autism to, to Counter the Original Assertion Against Vaccines, that started in the in the early 2000s with false claims that vaccines cause autism, and and that made me public enemy number one with anti-vaccine groups, or, or public enemy number one or two. And but it also gave me a front row seat to to watch how it evolved, and and you know put me up a uh, up against of an interesting cast of characters, including Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The the change was um, that it continued to accelerate. A lot of these uh, anti-vaccine groups started monetizing the internet. They were selling phony autism cures and nutritional supplements. And if you go to amazon.com and type in the words vaccination in the book section, all you get is anti-vaccine conspiracy books. So it, it became first a multi-million, maybe multi-hundreds of million dollar industry. And then I think for me, the big game changer was about even before the pandemic, it started to be adopted by the political right, which at one level made absolutely no sense, but at another level it did. It, it around this concept of health freedom, medical freedom. Hey, you can't tell us what we want to do with our kids. And and it, it began in California, but it really scaled up where I am in Texas. And it got adopted actually by the Republican Tea Party in Texas and started getting PAC money, political action committee money funding anti-vaccine groups. In fact, the anti a big anti-vaccine group formed their own political action committee, PAC, you know, supporting candidates to run on anti-vaccine platforms. And that's when you s started to see it become enmeshed in Republican Party politics. It also got to be okay. harder and harder for me to talk about because I'll just say one, one last thing, which is that, you know, my training as a scientist or a physician says you're not supposed to talk about Republicans and Democrats and liberals or conservatives or red states and blue states. So it's very uncomfortable for me to do it, but I feel like it's important to save lives. And so, you know, I just haven't found a way, Sam, to talk about it other than to talk about it. So I talk about it or I write about it, even though it's it's a scary place for me at times. Well, and I think, I mean, it's, it, you know, um, uh, you're, it, it's, it's just not your arena. It's not the arena of scientists. And, and, and it is, there's a sort of like a, in many respects, a market disadvantage. I mean, I find this also within the context of the education sphere too, because you're, you're, you're going a, a up against forces that um, have a slogan and you're talking about stuff that is nuanced and much harder to communicate. But I, I, we will. We yeah, will I mean, all of a sudden, I, and I've got you know Steve Bannon publicly calling me a criminal on yep. his Truth well, Social website and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's 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 so bizarre. I should say uh, full disclosure. I think the audience, uh, most of the audience, knows this. But I used to work uh, with uh, RFK Jr. Uh, on the radio, and there was a couple occasions in the past. Uh, this is you know uh, you know closer to ten years ago now, uh, where we would have a conversation about vaccines and um and and you know i started doing this uh show about 20 years ago and at that time was still in the wake of that lancet article that ended up getting pulled 
uh, about the, um, the, the, the correlation, at least, uh, between vaccinations and autism. And there was a theory around in like the early aughts that maybe it was the Marisol. That's but right. The, That's but right. the Marisol. So w- walk us through that, because yeah, the, so in it, 2004, it, it, I remember doing an interview about it and the person saying, like, we've got a year or two more to see if the, the removal of the Marisol is going to have any type of implications. And it ultimately didn't. But 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 walk us through that that first era. Oh, you're absolutely right. So it, it became kind of this kind of pyrrhic game of whack-a-mole or moving the goalposts. So every time anti-vaccine groups would make an assertion, the scientific community would spend a lot of funding and support to refute, to show it wasn't the case or find evidence that it wasn't the case. And then they'd come up with something else. So the original assertion, you're absolutely right. In the late 1990s, a paper was published in The Lancet, a prestigious British medical journal, by Andrew Wakefield and his colleagues claiming that it was the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the MMR vaccine, the live virus replicated in the gut. And somehow that led to, at that time, it was called pervasive developmental disorder or autism. And the scientific community responded. First of all, the study was shown not to be true. Second, the scientific community responded with big cohort studies showing the kids who got the MMR vaccine were no more likely to acquire autism than kids who didn't at some fair amount of expense. Then Robert F. Kennedy Jr. came along in 2005, and you're absolutely right. He wrote a, uh, an article in that very important biomedical journal, The Rolling Stone, call, saying right. that it was the thimerosal preservative, also published in Salon. Salon. And, and again, the scientific community did large, large cohort studies, even not non-human primate study, showing that that, that thimerosal was, was not doing that. And then... So that article was retracted by either Salon or Rolling Stone. I can't remember which, but then it was the other the other magazine followed along. And then um, and then it was Jenny McCarthy and Jim Carrey came along and said, we're spacing vaccines too close together. We have to green our vaccines or some nonsense like that. And then it was Alamin vaccines. And then it was HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancer. They claimed it was causing infertility or autoimmunity. And then... Robert F. Kennedy Jr. came back again and said it was causing something called chronic illness. And it became this really exhausting uh, uh, exercise. And But we did it. I mean, the scientific community did it and the, the data is sound. But the other part of the narrative is we know now what autism is and how it begins in early fetal brain development through the action of autism genes. A lot of them are neuronal cytoskeleton genes involved in neuronal connections. We actually did whole exome genomic sequencing on my daughter, Rachel, with my wife, Ann, and I, and found Rachel's autism genes. And there's a fantastic paper that came out of Stanford Medical School last year showing using brain organoids with neurons that have those autism genes, how they're migrating differently. So it's a very complete story. Um, it still it still hasn't gone away. I mean, that thread still is still around, and you see the autism people. Thread. Yeah, so the pe- people resurrect it, but I think we've taken a lot of wind out of that sail. The problem is the anti-vaccine groups needed to reinvent themselves, and the way they did it was by uh, enmeshing themselves in Republican Party politics. And and I think for the anti-vaccine groups, it was a way to get new relevance and funding. And I think for the for the extremist end of the GOP, it was a way to get a ready-made group of adherents, you know, to, to buy into all their all the other stuff. So I think it was mutually reinforcing for them. And and that's when it became a political movement. And that's when it became so dangerous during COVID because so many because it spilled over into COVID-19 vaccines, which is the subject of the book. Uh, and, and I just want to touch on this, too, in terms of this development, because I distinctly remember, too, uh, the HPV vaccine, the big the, the biggest uh, concern I heard, which was, this is going to make children more promiscuous. I mean, that was deployed by uh, the, the, the right at that time in whatever it was, like 2005 or six, I think, uh, when this was just being d- developed, that by giving you know, a 12-year-old or 13-year-old girl this shot, it wasn't so much that there was a fear of the vaccine as the vaccine functioning as a license to go have sex. Um, it was it was both. It was it was all of those things, and and it was so unfortunate because now in Australia they actually have a plan, Sam, to eliminate cervical cancer by the year twenty thirty or twenty thirty five. They're going to wipe out cervical cancer on on the, in the nation of Australia, the continent of Australia. We're going in the wrong direction. 
we're actually unnecessarily condemning a whole generation of girls and women to cervical cancer. I mean, it's so tragic. Um, so, all right. So it, you, you describe it as a marriage of convenience. Is there also an ideological value to the right? I mean, you know, the Republican Party picks up on these things, obviously, from an opportunistic standpoint. But um, uh, the the attacks on science have been embedded in the conservative movement, going back to Gertrude Hilmefarb, you know, uh, the, in the idea of like, if we can, it's two part. If we can, A, say there is no, um, uh, science is problematic in, in the sense that there's a certain objective reality to it. And if we can sort of uh, disabuse of that, then we, we can make everything based upon a values moral judgment and uh, we are better off fighting on that uh, that terrain. And then two, particularly when it comes to vaccines, we are talking about uh, public health. And the, the idea of public health is we owe, each one of us owes a responsibility to the person next to us on some level because we're all part of a society. And uh, that is the sort of like, and then that also you can see it uh, reflected in the in the policy decisions that need to be made from a strong sort of like uh, a state when it comes to issues of public health. Yeah, and I think it's so. You, you touch on about five or six points there, all all interconnected, and and it takes a little bit to unpack and unravel. So, so you're right. I think part of it is part of the larger context is an attack on the so-called elites. Um, or the intelligentsia um, that um, and scientists are are part of that. You know they're intellectuals, and and so there's that piece of it. I think you know going along with public health that requires that's right cooperation between people and, and, and butt up against these concept of health freedom, medical freedom. I think that that had a big piece to it. Um, and so what happened was it got adopted as part of the canon, along with, you know, the 2020 election was stolen and Putin over Ukraine, and somehow this became then part of it. And, and, and But the difference was by adopting this, it became a killing force, because in the book I point out that 200,000 Americans, 200,000 including 40,000 people in my state of Texas needlessly perished because they refused a COVID vaccine during the Delta and BA1 Omicron waves in 2021, 2022, after safe and effective vaccines became widely available. And and I benchmarked at the start of this, it's actually a kind of a post-Trump phenomenon. I, I benchmarked at the start of the CPAC conference of conservatives in Dallas in, in 2021, very much that health freedom rhetoric. First, they're gonna vaccinate you, then they're gonna take away your guns and your Bibles. And as that quote unquote, and as, and as ridiculous as that sounds to us, people people accepted it. So what they did was in their, in their zeal to push up against vaccine mandates, they went the next step and actively sought to discredit the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. So the um, Associated Press report on that conference um, at, at the time, um, was called they clapped at death of COVID. They're actually clapping for people not getting vaccinated. And then you saw the pile on. It was the members of the House Freedom Caucus, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and and um, uh, calling people like me medical brown shirts, starting comparing vaccines to the Holocaust, which was so incredibly offensive. Or, or Jim Jordan of Ohio, or Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul started doing this. Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin held these vaccine injury roundtables. And then very important, it was amplified every night on Fox News, and this was documented by two groups by Media Matters for America and also a research group out of the Federal University of Science and Technology in Zurich, Switzerland, documented every night Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity filled their nighttime broadcast in 2021 as the Delta wave was accelerating with anti-vaccine content. So, you know, people went down that rabbit hole and as a sign of allegiance to it, didn't get vaccinated and they paid for it with their lives on an unprecedented scale. And that's why I'm so passionate about talking about this because now I feel it's for me, you know, I developed low cost vaccines. We made a COVID vaccine for India and Indonesia, reached a hundred million people. We have a new human hookworm vaccine. Um, but now being a vaccine scientist, now making vaccines is the first part. The second part is trying to wait to counter all this anti-vaccine activism because that is also now a killing force in the United States.
Well, we we uh, uh, we we probably played uh, I don't know how many of those clips of uh, of of folks on Fox and uh, and also online. You know, the more online, the Rogans and the but, and but the, the other right wingers. That's right. But the point is, it's a whole ecosystem. You know, we we too totally, often totally we, we we call it this. You know, misinformation or infodemic, like it's just some random junk out there. But it's not that. It's as you point out, it's an organized, well-financed, and predatory movement that killed people, and um, and, and very uh, and entrepreneurial. I mean, that's yeah. it, it is. It is. You know, it, there are. I I can I can name you three uh, or four YouTubers right off the top of the bat where I can show you the just with a graph as to when they started to sort of like uh, carry this uh, anti-vax mantle and how it helped their numbers in many respects. Um, but let's, when you cite uh, 40,000 in Texas, 200,000, will you just explain to people the methodology in which you come up with that number? Just so that, like, you know, we can, we mm -hmm. can uh, address these type of things. I mean, I think for many people it's obvious, but, uh, but will you just... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, and that's actually not only my estimates, because a group at uh, the Chan Harvard School of Public Health has come up with this. They're all between 200 and 300,000 um, numbers. So my 200,000 number may be a little on the conservative side. So Harvard Chan came up with a similar number. Kaiser Family Foundation did. Charles Gabba, the health analyst for ACA signups, came up with this, came up with 180,000 to 230,000. But they all kind of come around 200,000 plus. Um, it's based on the um, the the continued rise of vaccinations after vaccines became widely available in March and April of 2021, and the fact that 85% um, of the deaths, 80-85% of the deaths were among unvaccinated uh, individuals, people who weren't getting vaccinated, number one. And so that's the number, but the other, the other really important part is overwhelmingly those people, those deaths among the unvaccinated were occurring in red states, um, red being Republican, blue being Democrat. And the, and the numbers from Charles Gabba and confirmed by New York Times and Axios and National Public Radio show that the redder the county, the higher the percentage of Republican voters, um, the lower the immunization rate and higher the death rate. So, so much so that David Leonhardt of the New York Times just called it red COVID because that, that, was, that was the reality. And you, yeah, you could see it firsthand. I mean, if I go into cons more conservative areas of Texas, like in East Texas or Central Texas, essentially everyone you talk to has lost a loved one because they've yeah. refused a COVID vaccine. That's where you really start start to hear it and see it. What, what are the responses? Like, I know, I, I mean, I I know um, uh, I spent some time, uh, uh, you know, in upstate New York, a fairly rural, rural area. And I know a couple of families who basically the same thing it, they they they're uh, they're fox news viewers uh they were determined not to get the vaccine and um they lost a member of the family um you know uh and in the instance in that instance in my experience um people were for the most part like they went out and they got vaccines and, and vaccinated and some of them uh were uh, we're, we're almost evangelical about it afterwards. Um, same time, I also know some folks up there who are vehemently anti-vax. Yeah, uh, it, it varied. I mean, you had you had people on their deathbeds in the ICU, you know, saying COVID was a hoax as their last dying breath, last dying words. I mean, so they weren't even dying with dignity all the way to people who say, okay, now I'm ready to get vaccinated, doc, you know, but that's not how vaccines work. You have to, you can't wait till you're in the ICU dying of COVID. You have, it's preventative, not therapeutic. All the way to those, you know, who say, don't do what I did, you know, go out and get vaccinated. But the responses were quite uh, variable, but all tragic in, in their own, in their own way. And, and that's one of the things that I say is, you know, these were victims. Um, these are, you know, amazing people, good people. I, you know, one of the things that I, I gave medical grand rounds at Stanford not long ago, and after I'd given medical grand rounds at University of Texas Tyler, which is a new medical school in East Texas, very conservative, and I said, you know, quite honestly, if I my car had broken down because of a flat tower, tire and you gave me the choice for that car to break down in Palo Alto, California, where Stanford is, or Tyler, Texas, I'd pick Tyler every time because people would be fighting over who's going to help you change your tire. Um, right. And so these were extraordinary people who were targeted by the Fox News anchors, 
the Murdoch family targeted by members of the House Freedom Caucus to U.S. senators. And, and it was, it's terrible. And there doesn't seem to be any accountability for it. That, that, that's the other, I mean, there's no, Sam, there's no autocorrection here. There's, it's not, you know, usually in the past, you know, if parents, cause I'm also trained as a pediatrician and, and, and in the past, if parents weren't vaccinating their kids and enough parents weren't vaccinating, there was a breakthrough infection like measles. Word would get around the kids were being hospitalized for measles, sometimes in the ICU, and that would be a self-correcting mechanism. Parents would go out and get vaccinated. I'm not seeing that now. I'm, I'm seeing this kind of doubling down. And, and you, you saw what the Florida Surgeon General has done now with yep. measles, not telling people to get, get vaccinated. And what you're seeing actually is this revisionist history coming out now out of the members of Congress. They're trying to say, no, no, it was the COVID vaccines that killed Americans, not not the COVID virus, which is ridiculous, or that the scientists invented the virus. And this is p- playing out now in the GOP-led House hearings, the sub- COVID subcommittee. They're, you know, per- they they literally say on their Twitter site. Um, uh, it says we're going to sell popcorn, quote unquote. Not even pretending this is anything other than political theater and parading prominent American scientists in front of C-SPAN cameras to humiliate them. It's just awful. And all right, let's, so let's. I want to address some of of, of that uh, of of sort of like th- that the, those some of those belief systems. Um, one of the things that I think sort of like makes it easier, but I don't know what the answer to this is that makes it easier for uh, these folks to sort of like create this, um, you know, this uh, shadowy sort of like, uh, 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 you know, backstory behind vaccines is the existence of the vaccine court, which is a court that is sort of uh, outside of our uh, typical judiciary system. It is one that uh, awards because there is immunity for, uh, uh, you know, uh, typical tort actions against uh, uh, vaccines. It awards um, people who have been injured by vaccinations, um, you know, uh, compensation for that outside of the system. And the reason is because, I mean, this is the nature again of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, of public health is that the decisions that are being made here are the same sort of like cost benefit analysis you'll make when you go in for uh, any type of treatment for yourself. The doctor says to you, nothing's 100 percent sure there is 80 percent, you know, chance that if we do this procedure, it's going to improve your back or whatever it is that you're doing. And they can't say 100 percent because nothing's 100 percent. Vaccines are no different in that regard. Uh, It's it's inevitable that there's going to be some people who are injured by vaccines, but the number of injured people is going to be far, far less than in the absence of the vaccines. And this, you know, conceptually, this is, I think, like, you know, for it's an easy concept to be manipulated. That That's um, right. I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, part, the truth is with these vaccine courts, one of the reasons they did it was to actually, it, it's actually in the plaintiff's favor. The, the, the bar to show evidence that you've been injured through a vaccine is far lower in a vaccine court than it would be in a real court. So it actually works more or less on on behalf of the parents better better than anything else but you're right it's there's all this weaponization by the anti-vaccine group same with the VAERS, the vaccine adverse events for well i was going to ask you about that like which is a i don't hear system. people talk about that anymore like i remember you know every day we would hear the number forty thousand, you know VAERS things and VAERS, of course is just sort of it's basically a uh, a tip line not not it's all unverified that, that's uh, right and, but and it's used because it's very sensitive but very non-specific so it can pick up in it and it works in the sense that it picks up rare events like rare myocarditis after mrna vaccines or or thrombotic thrombocytopenia events after the johnson and johnson vaccines and that's why it's set up but it's not meant to be causal in other words that's just that's to generate hypotheses. That's to see, okay, me, let's see if there's a link, but there's four or five other parallel systems that are in place like vaccine safety data link at CSA, CSIA to actually verify whether any of those things are actually true. But again, what the anti-vaccine groups do is they weaponize that and just say everything that's in VAERS is causally related, um, which it's not. Now, the, the other problem with this, of course, is 
um, the pharma companies don't generate a lot of love and affection. I mean, after after what does Pfizer and Moderna do after taking twenty five billion dollars in U.S. taxpayer money for the mRNA vaccines, either for development costs or for advanced purchase? They respond by jacking up the price to one hundred and thirty dollars a dose. I mean, you want to say to them, guys, have you no situational awareness? I mean, do you want the American people to hate you? And well, they don't so, care. So, so I, they I, don't honestly, care. They're, yeah, they're, I, mean, they're, I mean, they're just they're just going to make money hand over fist. The real problem is is that when we gave them that twenty five billion dollars, we should have had some strings attached. Is really yeah, what it comes to. Including, including the fact that there was no strings attached on how they communicate. So they would send out these press releases. And I mean, I was going crazy in 20 end of 2020 beginning of 2021 they'd send out these press releases you know when the company sends out a press release it's not meant for you or for me it's meant for the shareholders to jack up the stock prices right and so what they were doing was spectacularizing their accomplishment and they made it seem like these mrnas were miracles that it popped out of nowhere because they're such amazing companies and and it was tone deaf to the fact that you know the that those vaccines built on 10, 15 years of research from our group, for instance, showing how you deliver the spike protein, why the spike protein is a target, how you can use pieces of the spike protein. Um, and that's what led to our COVID vaccines for low cost COVID vaccines for in India and Indonesia, or the discovery of mRNA as a vaccine that came out of the University of Pennsylvania that won the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, that was 15. 20 years of work that went into that. But by omitting all of that, info, which is about the right time frame for it takes to develop a vaccine, but by omitting all of that, um, uh, it actually frightened people. And again, it was tone deaf to any understanding of vaccine hesitancy and, and, and took a lot of damage control from people like me and everyone else. But it was hard, hard to do that. Looking forward, I want to I want to ask about some of those questions around, you know, uh, uh, th that around those sort of like the, the policy decisions associated with this, because the real, in addition to the um, the sort of excess deaths that we had there, in addition to like now we start to see measles outbreaks here and there and this and that, the one of the things that I think is really most concerning is next next pandemic. Um, if if we if if we haven't traveled at least several generations until the next pandemic, it, it feels like we're going in at a massive disadvantage from, from a public health perspective. Do you think that there is, to the extent that there is a, um, a, a medical institution within the context of our government, the people who are sort of like, you know, uh, ostensibly will address this from a policy standpoint, do they have a different understanding of what the relationship should be if they ever did like an operation warp speed again with the uh, the the vaccine makers? Because and, and I want to speak a little bit more in just a moment about, you, you know, what you did, because um, and, 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 and other uh, 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 attempts to make a sort of like a more open source version of the vaccines. Uh, but. But do you think that there's a greater understanding within the government institutions as to like next time, maybe we got to say, mm, this is, we're going to fund this. We're going to guarantee that we're going to buy it, even if it doesn't work a certain amount of it so that you're covered, your risk, your downside is covered, but we're also going to limit your upside so that we can sort of both maintain trust with the citizens of this country and also make what we help develop more widely available. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes like this. I mean, Operation Warp Speed, in, in many respects, was a resounding success. I mean, my friend Alison Galvani is a professor at Yale School of Public Health, did the estimates and basically says those mRNA vaccines saved 3 million American lives, right? So if it wasn't for those mRNA vaccines, we would have had over 4 million deaths instead of 1 million deaths. So so that's that's extraordinary. But at the same time, you know, I think part of the problem was it was so, you know, the way it was set up and the way the contracts were done was exclusively a pharma deal. And and it didn't have to be that way. They could have gone with groups without like ours and had some low cost options that would have worked just as well using older technology that where people trusted because it's the same technology used as the recombinant protein hepatitis B vaccine that everyone's already given their kids. So I think, you know, by, by only um, focusing on the pharma companies, I think that was probably not, not wise um, uh, that, that, 
that we should have enlarged they should have enlarged the tent um somewhat because i get you know still get emails all the time saying hey doc i'm not taking that mrna vaccine despite what you say but i'll take your vaccine because I'll, I'll trust it more but we don't have a mechanism even to get it into the u.s so so i think that part needs to be fixed so there were a lot of good lessons learned from operation warp speed a lot of positive a lot of lives saved but we need to find a way to one broaden the tent and two limit the pharma communications there's got to there should have been some constraints on what they could say in in their press releases because i think that that did a lot of damage but then again even if everything were perfect right you'd still have a very aggressive anti-vaccine movement out there and i think that's that's the one that everyone is really trying to figure out how do you tamp that down because it's not i mean i think the health sector knows what to do at this point because it's a political enterprise linked very much to gop politics and so it requires a will likely require a political solution without any without any obvious answers about how to begin doing that uh well is one of those i mean i want to talk about the different political solutions that you see but is one of them to i mean it, it seems to me you know because from from watching your interactions with you know whether it was like with rogan and rfk jr or just uh the 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 claims that aren't necessarily directed at you but more broadly speaking this was just a money grab uh you know some variant of covid was fake and so that gave them an excuse to make the vaccine which was just a way to they make uh, billions of dollars you've uh you develop a vaccine that you did not make billions of dollars off of you will not make billions of dollars off of but probably saved i don't know how many millions upon millions of people's lives around the globe it was low cost if if we as a political uh entity had basically said like we're going to cap your profits on this we're going to you're going to make some money but we're going to cap it we're going to 10 or whatever uh you're not going to have to put out notices to your shareholders because we can put the notice out right here you're going to get 10 percent uh, profits i mean that to me seems like a big political reform that could be made in that instance that would at the very least um take one arrow out of their quiver when they start to talk about this stuff like because the profit motive is not it's not an absurd theory to have if you know you follow and i go down to uh you know uh, I, I do a, a tort uh conference uh, or twice a year and a lot of that has to do with medical devices and then you get discovery and you find out well they knew there was some problems here about pushing it off label or this and that like pharmaceutical companies do not have a great reputation in some respects about you know not trying to maximize profits sometimes at the expense of 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 safety and so uh it seems to me if you take out the profit the massive profit uh, factor one there's one less reason to be suspicious no, tr all everything you say is true but with one asterisk and the asterisk is the pharma many of the pharma companies would counter in saying you know we don't really have to be in the vaccine space um we can do much better with another ozempic me too compound um, rather than embarking on all the complexities of making a vaccine and so what they tend to do is you know hang the sort of damocles over everything and say look if you don't make it interesting enough for us we don't really have to be in the vaccine space we kind of it's a certain amount of noblesse oblige uh, um, um, with that and it's partly true partly not true as well i mean you know they're crying all the way to the bank right pfizer made pfizer moderna made it a ton of money um uh, on on those deals so the argument is if you make it less lucrative for them then then they're then maybe they'll not weigh in this time what's interesting that you notice is that the traditional big players in vaccine the vaccine space were not in on COVID nineteen right Merck and company was not a part of things GlaxoSmithKline was not a part of things Sanofi was not a part of things um, the ones who who were in were those who Pfizer you know has had some history with with vaccines not as much Moderna was was brand new um, etc so this was a way for them to get into the vaccine space and so that and and maybe to accelerate a new technology so there were other there are other gains there as well um what do you think about what happened with um the with the gates uh 
Gates, Bill Gates's involvement and uh, basically convincing, I think it was the University of Oxford to um, rather than uh, allow its so-called intellectual property to be more open source, but to sort of lock it up a little bit. What's your take on that? Your perspective. You know, I I don't have the inside baseball uh, on 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 that one. Uh, but what I can tell you is this: you know, when we were trying to get our low cost recombinant protein vaccine out there, nobody was rushing to help us. I mean, we had to um, raise money locally here in Texas, which we were able to do through. That's one of the blessings of being in a place like the Texas Medical Center. There's, you know, as opposed to being a professor at, at, at Penn or Columbia or Harvard, which is basically a, a hunting license to write grants, you know, you can you can raise money in, in if you have to, if you've got a really exciting idea here in Texas. So we were able to get money from the King Ranch, the Clayburg Foundation, um, uh, the Dunn Foundation, MD Anderson Foundation, Tito's Vodka gave us $2 million, um, which was, and not that I'm endorsing alcohol consumption, but should you have a vodka c- containing cocktail this evening, you, you, know, you definitely want to go with Tito. So, so that was great. But the fact that I had to do that was you know, unfortunate, right? I mean, it should have been a much easier path to do something like develop, developing a low-cost COVID vaccine for the world. And you could not have gotten into something like warp speed. It was not in any way... We could uh, not get it. We, we tried. We could not get on their radar screen. We weren't a far... The, basically, the thinking was, unless you're a big pharma company, you don't have the chops to pull this off. And, and, and that was the end of the discussion. And there's still very much that mindset in the vaccine space that I'm trying to work again, not to, and what I say, it's not to demonize the pharma companies. They do what they do. They provide a lot of vaccines for global health, for the gut, what's called the Gavi Alliance, global Alliance for vaccines and immunization, but brought in the tent, brought in the ecosystem to give other players a chance because, um, and especially with partnering with vaccine producers in low and middle income countries. The other thing they did was they all went for brand new technologies, mRNA, particle vaccines. And and when you do that, even though you get some, you advance the science and you get a lot of interesting new vaccine technologies, as any engineer will tell you, there's a learning curve before you can go from zero to 15 billion doses that were needed when you use a brand new technology. So what happened was predicted and predictable. They made just enough to be bought up by North American countries, US and Canada and and Western Europe, and that left all the low and middle income countries out in the cold. And that's when we were getting frantic phone calls from ministers of health and ministers of science in low and middle income countries because they knew we were working on coronavirus vaccines for 10 years or more. And they said, can you help us? So we did what we could. We transferred the technology with no patent. We would send our production cell bank by World Courier to these countries and work with them on scale it up. And, And it worked. We got 100 million people. Uh, immunized. So that was very, very exciting. But um, the the whole system should have functioned better. There should have been somebody with that situational awareness to say, you know, if we go with all brand new technologies, or what I sometimes call all brand new shiny new toys exclusively, it's going to leave the low and middle income countries out in the cold. Nobody had that situational awareness to say, well, maybe we should have a technology that could be compatible with vaccine producers that are in low and middle income countries. There's about 40 of them that band together and call themselves the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network. And that's where we came in. And, and it was it was very meaningful to be able to do that, but also shocking, right? That, that, well, that's, that's what, what, that's that's what my first took, reaction right? is like, well, how is that... Uh, that seems like uh, one of those, like, uh, there should be somebody in the government and I should be able to say to them, like, that's, you had one job to do. And that's the job is to figure out, like, how can we produce as many vac- vaccinations as possible? And, you know, I could even see, like, okay, we're going to go with, like, a low risk, uh, you know, in terms of, like, production and turnaround time and this and that. And we're going to go with, like, a moonshot version. And we're going to do yeah, everything. Right. Ba- balance balance out the portfolio. Of this. How, right, right. How, how did that not happen? 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one day someone will write the book. But I think everybody was so enamored with the mRNA technology. And it is an exciting technology. It has its weaknesses. It, the durability is not as great as we'd like it to be. And that's why you have. You mean it has to be stored well, in like a refrigerator, that type no, of thing? No, no. Well, the fact that you need, it's not holding up in terms of durability or protection. That's why you have to have all these boosters I see, um, okay. all, all the time for, for reasons that we're just starting to find out now because of long lasting plasma cells and that, and that sort of thing. But um, that that's right. I mean, it, it would have been great if we could have had that better balance. And, and it's, at some point, someone will dissect out how all those decisions were made. And 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 and. But but I mean, the U.S. you know it worked out because enough doses were just enough to be bought up by the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. and France and Western Europe and Japan. But there was no real true consideration for global health equity in in the vaccine that you developed is that a a one and done or is that uh do you have boosters for that or you do do it in so a it's seasonal? Two dose. so it's a recombinant protein made through an older process the same process the hepatitis b vaccine a recombinant protein made through microbial fermentation and yeast so it, it uses a big bioreactor um, and um, and this has been around two or three decades. It's used to make the hepatitis B vaccine. It's one of the lowest cost technologies out there, incredibly safe, um, simple refrigeration, um, great safety profile. So, you know, when you start checking all the boxes on the checklist, it really is perfect for any country, but especially for low resource countries. Now, we've just made the XBB booster version of it, a low cost XBB booster. So it costs around $3 a dose. Um, and um, and now we're doing this now for our, our other vaccines. Our, we also have a whole portfolio of parasitic disease vaccines, like a new human hookworm vaccine. That uh, That's the pr project that I worked on as an MD PhD student in New York 40 years ago. Now, after 40 years, it's, we're finally showed it's working. So that's very exciting. And so if, I mean, doesn't why wasn't there a decision to sort of like somewhere within the U.S. Uh, federal government health apparatus to say like okay we have this problem uh, rightly or wrongly that uh, people are very suspicious of the mRNA vaccinations um, we have this vaccination that has been administered to hundreds of millions of people uh, around the globe I'm speaking of the one that you you helped develop um let's uh it's it's low cost and we can bring it back here open it up uh and and i don't know i mean why wouldn't they even just like distribute it through medicare or, or, yeah, or medicaid yeah. like i don't understand like what is there is there is there anybody is there any political uh is there anybody in our politics today that is attempting to do something like this do we have well, any we've been a We've been approached by um, Elizabeth Warren's people, Senator Warren of Massachusetts, of oh, course, woman Jay Jayapal of um, uh, um, in, West in uh, Washington State, who, who wants to look into this and ask some of those questions. So I think people will start to look at it. I mean, it seems sort of obvious to me. Yeah. I, yeah. I, um, in, in terms of like pushing back on this, like, uh, Lastly, like, I, I know, like you, uh, you, 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 you suggest a sort of like a, a Southern Poverty Law Center for scientists in your book, where which presumably would basically um, put some sunlight on the various um, anti-vaccination forces and maybe sort of like make more explicit the relationship between these sort of like entrepreneurial, these the political entrepreneurs, as it were, in this space. Um, what, what, well, the, what's happening is, you know, it's not only an attack on vaccine science or science or biomedical science, um, but it's also an attack on the scientists um, and portraying us as public enemies or enemies of the state. And that's where it gets really scary very fast. So the climate scientists have been dealing with this for, for a while. I was just going to say, like, and, uh, is there a and, model from them that you... Yeah, well, actually, it's now I've teamed up with Michael Mann, who's a professor at Penn, the one who just won the yes. lawsuit against... Um, so Michael and I are now partnering on a new book, which is going to be called Science Under Siege. And... 
and it, it compares and contrasts the attacks on biomedicine with the attacks on climate science. And there's, it's the the two circles of the Venn diagram are not a hundred percent overlapping, but but there's a significant amount of overlap and sometimes coming from the same sources. So we're hoping that will shed some light on, you know, how we manage this. In the case of the climate scientists, they've actually created a climate science legal defense fund, something like a Southern Poverty Law Center for the protection. I mean, you know, I'm, I feel well supported by my bosses at Baylor College of Medicine, the Texas Children's Hospital. But if you're a more junior scientist or you know, mid-career scientist, and if you don't get that support, it could be a very lonely and scary place when, when you're attacked and, and, and hoping to create something for them to have a resource to go to. Is I there... mean, it's unfortunate that we're not our usual people that you'd expect to be helping us or not. I mean, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy is silent. Um, PCAST, President's Council of Science Advisors, is silent. The Health and Human Services Agencies don't say anything to support us or defend us. And and how do our most of the scientific societies are fairly silent because they just don't want to get... Nobody wants to get into a fight. Nobody wants get, to get into a fight and get attacked. And part of their reasoning is interest. In some cases, they'll say, well, you know, we have to be politically neutral. Right, and because would because the only way to talk about this is talk about the partisan divide and the attack from the far right. They they don't know how to manage that. But at some point, you know, to paraphrase Desmond Tutu or Ellie Wiesel, I have to say, you know, if you're always neutral, it favors the aggressor, the tormentor, and 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 that's what's happening as well. So we have to get comfortable um, talking about. There's not. It's it's kind of unprecedented. So I think everyone's playing catch up at this point. Are, is the working, I've, I've interviewed uh, uh, Michael Mann on this program probably, I don't know, half a dozen times over the years. I mean, because he uh, was almost like the pioneer, uh, at least one of the sort of the point people for getting attacked uh, by, uh, by, by science deniers in one shape or another. I imagine there were some folks, uh, you know, uh, 50 years ago where, uh, you know, the cigarette uh, um, manufacturers were doing this as well to specific uh, doctors, maybe not... Uh, the, you know, the doctors didn't have the same uh, opportunity to uh, communicate. Are you doing like the audience for this? Is it there? There seems to me there's multiple audiences for, you know, something that you and man would produce. Right. I mean, one is the scientists. One is the policymakers. One is sort of like the culture and those people who report on it. Um, like, is there all an internal um apparatus to sort of say like we need to train scientists because it's no longer you know well, well there's multiple things so so you're asking all the right questions um i think one is first of all just describing the ecosystem is important because people aren't aware how extensive and pervasive it is right it's coming from you know high net worth in individuals it's coming from political action committees it's coming from the libertarian think tanks um um, these people are being recruited even from top universities to, to, to put out this, this stuff. It's coming from, you know, Elon Musk and Twitter or X or whatever you, you want to call it. And now it's now, and it's being embraced at the highest levels of the U S government through the house freedom caucus to U S senators. So I think, and then the, the national media and even the mainstream media, I mean, I mean, Fox News is probably one of the worst offenders, but even you're seeing more and more this kind of uh, false equivalency spill into the Washington Post or or the New York Times, you know, giving, basically talking about that the scientists could have made the COVID virus in the same breath that, you know, there was a zoonotic spillover. And it's not the case. And so there's a lot of education from the mainstream media that needs to be done. So I think, you know, how you walk this back is, is complicated and um, I think one is I think the scientific community needs to feel more comfortable doing public engagement. Um, my friends at Research America, which is a policy group based in DC, do these studies every couple of years and they more they're pretty quite consistent. They basically say three quarters of Americans at least cannot name a living scientist. And and if they do, it's you know Bill Nye the Science Guy or or Neil deGrasse Tyson, and and nothing wrong with them. They're great people, but they're not you know, what a typical working scientist does in terms of lab meetings and grants and 
major revisions over paper. So we're invisible. So that's partly our fault as a scientific community. And and the universities tend not to like their docs and scientists speaking out because they're very risk averse. So how do we change that whole culture to make it feel more comfortable? I mean, I get told, you know, for years, um, I would get told or, or colleagues, now I have a little more freedom to do this, but for years is, hey, you're an academic, you're free to speak out whatever you want, dot, 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 but don't screw this up and get the institution in trouble. Well, of course, if you're out there enough and you're speaking out there enough, you will get the institution in trouble. And, and you need to know that you have that, that the institution has your back and, and things are good at Baylor and Texas Children's, but others are not so forgiving. Um, then I think the other problem is um, we have the um, rapidly dis um, evaporating science journalists. We don't have science journalists anymore right. like we used to. So there, you know, during the COVID pandemic, I had to spend a lot of time educating journalists without science backgrounds about COVID. And, and for the most part, they, they worked hard to get it right. But, you know, it was Im imperfect. So we need um, more, more science journalists. And then... You know, I think the big unknown is though, how do we push back against the monster, the this you know anti-science machine that's causing so much damage to the to the country, and um, and that one, I think there there I sort of give people the longest. I don't know the answer to the question answers I think I've ever given. Um, I think everybody's struggling with it at this point. I mean, Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, started this, and you talked about you know, advisories with the social media companies, which is about the minimum thing you could, the most innocuous thing you could say. Uh, but even then, you know, now the Missouri Attorney General is suing him. There's a case going on in the Missouri Supreme Court, Missouri versus Murthy, um, basically saying he's not, they're not even, we're not even allowed now to dismantle disinformation. So it's bad enough they're promoting disinformation, but now they're gonna block any attempt to, to prevent you from from uh, going up against it. It's going to make it very difficult. Um, all right. Lastly, in terms of COVID, um, what, when you project forward thinking about COVID, aside from the, the I, I would perceive it like growing or at least the continuing sort of anti-vaccination, uh, sort of like a weaponization, aside from that, when you look at the, uh, the, the, the horizon here, in terms of COVID, what what worries you the most? Is it like sort of the continuance of, of long COVID in some people? Is it the idea that we could have a, I don't know what you would call it, a, like a second order infection in the way that, um, you know, shingles comes back from the chicken pot, from chicken pox 50 years later or something like that? Or is it a um, COVID mutating again in a way that becomes more virulent uh, or problematic? Well, I have both near-term and long-term worries. My, my near-term is, I mean, the good news right now, the numbers are starting to go down in terms of hospitalization. So I'm hoping the worst of this current JN.1 wave is, is over. But I think there's a high probability that another one will come up. Exactly which, I, I don't see any new variant becoming obvious, but I think, you know, we have to assume there, there could be another one. And of course, people... People are done with boosters. I mean, I, I took my COVID immunization, annual immunization last fall. As I like to say, me and six other people did that. And Well, uh, I was one of them. So, uh, so, so, but the point, but you get the idea. People yeah. are not accepted. So that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. And then the other problem is this. Um, remember, COVID-19, which is also called SARS-2, is the third major coronavirus epidemic pandemic we've had in this new century. So we had two th SARS, the original severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2002. We've had MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012. That's why we began working on coronavirus vaccines, because we knew there'd be a third one. And sure enough, right on cue, COVID-19 appeared. But there's going to be a fourth one most likely before the end of 2030. So every six, we're seeing this cadence of every six to seven years, a new major coronavirus pandemic, and no one's going to have an appetite to do much about it when, when it occurs. So that that really concerns me uh, as, as well, because um, this, this anti-science movement is, is so strong. So that that's most likely what we're in for. Um, and, and it's happening because in part because of climate change. And this is why working with Michael is important uh, because because of climate change. These are viruses that come from bats. And with 
warming temperatures and altered rainfall pattern, bats are flying to new places, seeking new food habitats. They're coming closer into contact with people. There's increasing urbanization and deforestation. So people are having more contacts with bats. This explains not only the rise of coronaviruses, but why we've had two major Ebola uh, epidemics in 2014 and 2019. These are also Ebola or phyloviruses that come from bats. So we are in this new normal, as, as I say, we're going to see a regular cadence of catastrophic pandemic threats. And that's why we have a White House Office of, of Pandemics now uh, to, to look at that. Uh, but, you know, I worry, I mean, I think the good news is I think we can make vaccines pretty rapidly against a lot of these, but we still have the issues of equity. And we still have the, the reality now that um, there's so much uh, pushback now against vaccines or any other kind of interventions. That's going to make it very tough. Uh, Dr. Peter uh, Hotez, Dean uh, for the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and author of uh, your most recent, The Deadly Rise of anti science anti-science a scientist warning uh thanks so much for your time today we'll put a link uh, to that book at majority.fm and in our podcast and youtube description really appreciate your time thank you sam this is great i really appreciated the opportunity